Today, hosting the panel discussion, just like she did last year, is Carla Jean Stokes. Carla Jean received her Master's of History at Wilfrid Laurier University in 2011 and went on to receive a, a Master's of Photographic Preservation and Collections Management at Ryerson University. I guess what's that, Toronto Metro University now in 2015. In the same year, she won the Photographic Historical Society of Canada Thesis Prize for her paper, British Official First World War Photographs, 1916 to 1918, Arranging and Contextualizing a Collection of Prints at the Art Gallery of Ontario. She gives lectures on war photography and curated the exhibition 14 to 18, The First World War Illustrated in Vernon, BC from May 13th to September 30th, 2018. In 2021, we were delighted to have Carla Jean join our committee for strategy and planning for the History Symposium. And uh, if you look at our catalog of talks, you, you'll see Carla Jean's excellent presentation from our 2021 conference. So Carla Jean, I'm going to put it in your hands. Take it away. Thanks so much, Tom. And thanks to Chris, who's uh, hanging out in the background here taking care of a lot of uh, the live chat and sort of the technical aspects of the conference over th this two-day weekend conference. Um, so first I'm gonna introduce Megan Hamilton. Megan was our three-minute thesis prize winner last year. Um, she's from Vernon, British Columbia. I'm reading, I'm reading this off my phone. Uh, the Megan one should be easy. I know her credentials quite well. She's from Vernon, British Columbia. She is a social and military historian of the 20th century. She has an honors BA degree from Wilfrid Laurier University and a master's degree from the University of Waterloo. Her federally funded master's research focused on the Canadian experience of the Second World War, um, specifically the Vernon military camp. Megan's work has been published by a number of both academic and general audience platforms. And in 2022, uh, she won the Tri-University History Program's top essay prize for master's students, and she's currently in London, UK, where she's on a also fully funded PhD with Dr. Jonathan Fennell. Um, and now I'm paraphrasing because I'm going to skip ahead, but that's why, like I said, I like to call Megan the future Dr. Hamilton. Um, and next we're going we're gonna to introduce Dr. Cynthia Camacchio. Uh, Professor Emerita at Wilfrid Laurier University. She taught Canadian history at Laurier for nearly 40 years. She's the author of several books, including Nations Are Built of Babies, Saving Ontario's Mothers and Children, um, The Infinite Bonds of Family, The Dominion of Youth, and she has just finished with Neil Sutherland, Ring Around the Maple, Children and Childhoods in Settler Canada, 19th and 20th Centuries, and that is going to be a fantastic book, I already know. And finally, we're <laughs> going to introduce, Dr. finally, last but not least, one of my dear friends, Dr. Mike Bechtold. He holds a PhD in history from the University of New South Wales in Canberra an MA and an honors BA from Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, he's the author or editor of eight books and numerous articles. His most recent monograph is Flying to Victory, Raymond Collishaw and the Western Desert Campaign. I got it right here. Mine is signed, no big deal. Uh, <laughs> he's the co-author of a series of guidebooks about Canadian battlefields in the Second World War. He specializes in the fields of military air power, especially tactical air operations in the First and Second World Wars, Canadian Army in Normandy and Northwest Europe, um, and a whole bunch of other, whole bunch of other fantastic credentials. Um, he's currently employed as a historian with the Royal Canadian Air Force and Heritage Section. Okie dokie. So like I said, today's topic, hi everyone, hi panelists, hi audience. It's great that, that you're all here with us on Sunday. Um, I can't say what time it is. It's 10 a.m. here, but it's a, we have a few people from different time zones in different countries on different continents, which is fantastic. But despite the, the geographical range, today we're talking about Canadian history in the 21st century. We know that history is studied or approached by people within the academy, independent researchers, and just normal people uh, who ha they have library cards and they like to study history. And so today we've handpicked a panel of historians who are at different stages in their careers so we can talk about the challenges and the opportunities of studying Canadian history in the 21st century. So we're going to put Mike into the hot seat first. So Mike, my first question for you is, I want to ask you if you can define for us what it is that historians do. We know a wide range of people study history, but what makes you a historian? Yeah, well, thanks, Carla Jean, for inviting me for this panel. I think it's a really important conversation, and I'm, I'm really uh, happy to have this uh, talk with uh, Dr. Camacchio and, and Megan and, and yourself. It's, 
the, the question of what's a historian is one that's really kind of challenged me over the years because, um, I mean, we're all historians here. I don't think there's any question about that. But so is the person that's doing their, their family history or the person that's writing about their hometown or something like that. You don't need any particular credentials to be a historian. Um, I, I like to call myself a professional historian or a public historian, um, because I think that indicates that you've had some sort of training, some sort of uh, experience in, in the field. And I, I really think that for uh, defining what a historian is, a historian provides context. Um, anybody can tell stories, anybody can put together um, a, a catalog of what's happened in the past, but I think historians and especially professional historians add context. They look at the material, they consider it, they evaluate it, they judge what is valid and, and what might not be valid, and then they come up with some sort of a, a judgment of um, sort of what makes sense about our understanding of the past, and, and to me that all comes down to context. Great, thanks so much. Cynthia, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I would agree entirely with what uh, Dr. Beck told, Mike has said. He was my student once upon a time. <laughs> so it's kind of hard, you know, it just makes me both old, but also forgetting that I, you know, that I had to call him doctor now. Anyway, um, I would add to the contextual part, which is important, but after all, again, no one can dispute the history belongs to all of us. And so even in terms of, you know, do you have to be a professional in order to be able to put together a story about the past with some context, not necessarily. So when my students ask me this, first year students, or when I tell them whether they, they wanna know or not, I try to compare what we do to um, what forensic scientists do. We, like the forensic scientists, um, are interested in the dead, <laughs> but it's not as though we just go dabbling and, you know, they don't just, look at bodies for the sake of you know, dabbling in it. They have a precise skill set, and it is a science because they have to put clues together and follow leads and so on. That's what we do too, that distinguishes us because of our training from your regular person who's interested in history or those who even go further and publish in it. We have to follow a set of clues. We have to layer evidence. We go from one to another to put together something like a cohesive narrative. So what we do is scientific, but it's also an art in that, you know, it has to come together as in a narrative form with the analysis drawn from our, our learning, our experience in it. But we have to be able to tell a cohesive story about the past and one that is plausible. We can't just weave together a whole bunch of clues and so on and say, oh, this is exactly what happened. We can never go to the exact part, unlike maybe the forensic scientists. And we don't get our own mini series on TV or anything like that. But at the same time, I think that's what it is. It's a combination of science that comes from training and practice and the art. Because to be a good historian, I think you have to be a reasonably good writer. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. That part, you know, it, it is literature. Mm -hmm. So that's it. That's what that's what I would say to answer that question. Thanks. So Megan, I want to bring you into this. Um, Cynthia has really pointed out the fact that historians actually have to have a, a, a very wide ranging skill set. Do you think that the average person that you happen to meet, you tell them you're a historian, do you think they have a grasp of that skill set that you need to possess? I, I I don't think so. I think, I mean, you know, I just earlier when we were talking about Cynthia's um, upcoming book and, you know, she was talking about all the work that goes into that. I don't, I mean, it, it, it goes with any profession, right? Like most of us don't have any idea how much, you know, detail and work go into other professions when we don't know the profession ourselves, ourselves. But um, I, like just building off the, the prior two answers, um, to the initial question is that exactly, I think anyone who's going to practice the study of history can be can considered a historian, but it takes that extra level and that extra training to be considered a professional historian and also a good historian. Um, mm -hmm. I think that Cynthia had some great points about, you know, put, making logical conclusions out of the clues that we find, because, you know, obviously we've seen, we've seen some cases of, of historians and those who call them professional historians themselves professional historians uh, not making logical conclusions and, and not causing issues um, and and we see that with various you know controversial events in history um, 
but but no there is there is a whole range of skills and like we've talked about these days it's you know everything from learning how to 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 work with with your colleagues and uh you know putting together uh pieces to publish to actually doing your research um and, and being uh kind of a constant student and being open to learning so i think there's just this whole range of skills um that of course you know people aren't going to appreciate because they don't know the uh, the discipline if they're not in it but it the, it goes the exact same way uh for anything that we don't know we're gonna we're gonna move on from this question really quickly, but I I just want to go back to Mike. Um, you said like history does or can belong to everyone. So how do you kind of negotiate that? Because I know, particularly in your field, the field of the history of air power, we see people who are maybe not historians still writing books about it in terms of um, bomber command, uh, the Allied bombing campaigns. You and I have talked about this, so do you want to make a comment on that before we? Yeah, it, it, it's a tough one because good history is good history, and you you don't have to have a PhD or or even a master's to write good history. I have a uh, a, a lot of colleagues, a lot of friends, a lot of uh, works that I admire that have been written by people that don't have that uh, credentials behind their name. It, it's all about how you approach it, how you study it, how you evaluate that evidence. So. Um, by and large, good history is written by PhDs, but not exclusively. And there's bad history written by PhDs as well. Mm -hmm. I think we're all familiar with 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 the uh, examples of that. Um, but by the same token, there's good history written by sort of I, I don't want to use the term amateur because I think that um, is is not appropriate, but by non-professional historians. So mm -hmm. you really have to analyze it based on uh, the, the work itself. And, and like I said, there's good stuff out there and there's bad stuff. So any, anybody can do good and anybody can do bad, but uh, it, it, it takes a, a lot of work to get it right. Megan, I want to move on a little bit um, because you're you are sort of becoming... You're not quite early career because you're really doing a fantastic job of, of everything you do. And I'm not going to gush, but I am proud of you. Um, but as our youngest panelist, um, it's really normal to think that the challenges that younger people face today are totally unique to them. As a historian, I know that you know that there are cyclical repetitions through generations. But I'm interested in knowing how growing up for you in the first generations of the 21st century, how has that shaped you as a historian? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole thing, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. And, you know, we can see that through so many different levels um, in terms of world events or us as historians or things like that. Um, yeah, I think there's, I mean, my, my biggest answer to this would be how the historiography has changed, right? Um, so obviously uh, my specialty is military history and you know as we've we've developed into social and cultural um interpretations of military history and 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 things have become more diverse and and versatile um i think that that has opened up um all kinds of new considerations in terms of what we study um and and what we call military history right and i i know this talk is about canadian history more broadly yet you have you know a couple military or military adjacent historians here so of course it's going to come to military history um but i think it's really exciting exciting what what is open for us to study and what is open for us to you know um uh, to analyze and and use different lenses for i mean obviously there's there's an obvious answer that when i was thinking about this it was staring me in the face was covid right covid has has painted the last couple of years of everyone's lives um i did the last year of my undergraduate degree completely online uh, <laughs> including a class with mike um and then my master's was mostly in person, but a bit online. And then thankfully I'm all in person now. Um, but that's best painted everyone's experience. And of course, that's uh, some people have enjoyed that more than others. I mean, during my fourth year, I was just very busy trying to do, you know, my undergrad thesis and and all my different classwork and things like that. So I was thankful for it that I was able to just stay home and just just work throughout the day and kind of not, you know, be walking between classes and little things like that. But I mean, that's, you know, that's worked for me, but there, I see historians and, and scholars now who are just trying to pick up the slack and, you know, it, it turned out well, but so many people were, you know, couldn't get into archives and, you know, totally messed up the timing of, of different things. And um, so 
it's going to be interesting in the next decade, I guess, how what influence this has um, as as we go into the next decade of um, of scholarship and to see if maybe, you know, this increased amount of digitization. I mean, that's a big one for the 21st century with technology. Um, if that's going to have, you know, an influence or if we're going to see a bit of a lag as people are trying to catch up and and they've been trying to work with what they've had over the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, no, I think that the opening up of the historiography, the, the constant... Um, progress of it is really exciting. Um, and of course, the increasing technology and access to sources and things like that um, is is huge for, for our generation because, you know, uh, and I'm going into a little bit of another point here, but I, I, you know, I'm so lucky these days, I go to the archive, and I just click like a 1000 photos, right on my phone, mm -hmm. upload them straight to my computer, um, and, and just have them right there. And I can't even imagine uh, my my supervisor, I mean, anyone, but Jonathan has been letting me uh, look through his PhD research, and it's just binders and binders of photocopied material, right. And um, I think mm -hmm. that my generation and and those who are researching now can be especially uh, appreciative of having that ease of, of access and technology. So Megan, you and I are about a decade or a decade and a half apart in, in our careers and slash in our lives. And so you and I will be hoarding like no one ever before, <laughs> just thousands of documents that we'll never be able to use. Um, so you, go ahead, so yes. I just, sorry, I just want to make a point here because I go back a lot further than you guys. If you're a decade apart, we're half a century. But <laughs> I did my graduate work in the 80s. And at that time, um, there were very, very few women in graduate history programs. And we were made to feel very unwelcome mm -hmm. by a largely male faculty. OK, the past five years or so, I mean, it's been improving, thankfully, all along, all during my teaching career. In the past five years or so, I would say at least 60% of my undergrads are women in my history courses and ab about the same amount in my graduate courses. And I think that's a wonderful thing that we should not take for granted because it's it was hard one. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, my generation might have had it hard, but the ones before us were the ones who really had to fight for that right to go on for that kind of study and gain some respect. So let me just throw that in, please. Uh, that's great to hear. I took I took your graduate seminar in 2010 and 2011, and I think it was mm -hmm. probably about 50-50, maybe a little higher. Yeah. It was the, the War at Home, which was a, a very popular course. Yeah, um, and that was, you know, throughout the past 10 years or so, I've seen more and more women coming into graduate program, especially at the PhD level. The MA is a transitional degree, but to go on to a PhD used to be practically impossible for a woman. And so again, these are good things and you know, all welcome is what I say. So you and Mike have both been teaching for you know decades really. And, and so to add on to Megan's answer, do you see part, particular moments in time as they happened in, in Canada that have kind of opened up what, what we can talk about as historians? Was there ever a moment where you were like, oh wow, now we can talk about this. Mike, you go ahead. Um, no, I haven't really had the experience of now we can talk about this. Um, if, if anything, it, it's going the other way in terms of there's topics now that are more difficult to talk about, um, that are harder to, to bring up, that have connotations that have always been there but are front and center. And they, um, if, if they're discussed in the wrong way, they can cause issues. I'm thinking about things like um, uh, the, the statues issue is a, is a really big one. And um, I, I'm from Baden, Ontario, and uh, Baden had gone forward to have a bunch of statues of Canadian prime ministers. And that kind of blew up in their face with the, the sort of the past of, of John A. Macdonald. I mean, Laurier experienced that as well because the statue started there as, as, as well. And these are, are difficult topics. They've always been difficult topics, but even now um, they're even more difficult to talk about because of the connotations. And uh, you want to strike balance, you want to be fair, but they're, they're, it, it, it's, it's challenging sometimes to, to have a, an open discussion of, of these issues. Uh, Cindy, have you come across that as well, or or am I? Definitely, it, it was definitely very much a challenge. 
Um, I think uh, in my last couple of years, unfortunately, you know, the last three years heading into retirement, I spent mostly on Zoom. And somehow it is not, you cannot convey the same kind of, I don't know how to nuance maybe is what I'm getting at on Zoom, even though I lectured, you know, the same way that we're doing now in person. Um, I found that students either were not getting what I was saying or because few of them ever bothered for all that I encouraged them to interrupt and ask questions, few did, um, they were misconstruing a lot of what I was saying. And, you know, I would say things extremely carefully, like, look, when I use the term race in this situation, I am talking about racialization, you know, this kind of thing and how, and, I, and when I quote from some white supremacist, that, that is in quotes, people understand that. And even then, somehow it wasn't, it often wasn't good enough. They, they thought that I was saying things as opposed to saying that X said that in the past at a time when racism was basically endemic. And, and that's the issue of context too, Mike, I find. Uh, now, um, many of them are either unwilling or untrained to accept context. So that when you say, yes, Johnny McDonald was profoundly racist, but show me someone of his time who was not, okay? Someone of his time and social status and power in society, okay? No one that I know of is on record, the historical record, is having challenged Sir John's racist terms and saying, let's do something else hmm. with regard to our Indigenous people. That's wrong. It's racism, but it's not making apologies or excuses for that to point out that this is, he could not have been better than, than the people around him. If that is the way the Canadians felt, and not just the elite, but the elite in particular, and then going down to the lower class, well, again, the racism is right through society. And if we don't understand that, it makes it harder to understand why, you know, um, we need to, why reconciliation needs to take place and why education is a way through that. So sometimes I felt like I was talking against myself, you know, I'm talking about let's get educated so we understand better where this comes from. And I'm hearing, no, we're not talking about that because they were racist. But that's why we have to talk about it. Exactly. Because they were yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway, Can, uh, it, it was that part was difficult. I would say it's not linear. I have found I found through my like yeah almost half a century of teaching that when I went into grad school, social historians were breaking onto the scene and opening up exciting new areas of gender and family and labor and the working class. You know, so I felt that we could talk about more things than before, and then somehow we've gone back to a place where there's a lot that we can't talk about anymore, that it becomes dangerous to talk about because no one is going to listen to you explain why you said it that way, I felt. Mm -hmm. And none of that really happened, but I felt always on edge about it. You know, it caused me a lot of stress the last, the last few years of teaching to think, what if I say something that's misconstrued? It, it often was, but not, no one really contested because they just wanted to go home, I think. <laughs> you know? But there you go. That, that's, yeah. Can, can I just add something to that, Carla? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it, it's such an issue these days, I think, because as historians, we're asking these big questions and we're working through them and that takes time, right? The historiography, historiography is not quick um, and, and things take time for people to do the research and, and you know, do the analysis and things like that. But the real world doesn't ha doesn't work like that, right? People are reactionary, news is quick um, and, and things are much more instant. And I think that's something we we, like as historians we're, we have to battle with um, and, and that's where I see that you know when professional historians engage with the public through other medium where we can publish quicker for example I'm thinking of the conversation uh, which is a, a wonderful um, journalist journalistic website that um, mm -hmm. publishes academic work in kind of a in kind of a journal uh, blog kind of format but I think it's mm -hmm. it's you know, this, these timings, you know, we're, we're taking their time to ask these big questions, but like Cynthia said, like, you know, they're not always going to sit there and listen. And uh, as we explain uh, why we think that. So I think there's a bit of a kind of some tension there between uh, what academic history is doing and the big questions we're trying to work through. Uh, and then the reactionary kind of 
things we're seeing out in the public and the pendulum has swung you know we see it sometimes with some issues swing swing quite far as as the reaction comes out so Cynthia has pointed to like Zoom, Zoom is maybe the most ideal way to sometimes communicate people in a virtual sense and social media being the other end of that, the least ideal way. But Megan has pointed out that a lot of the public is looking for that instant gratification. We want like we we some people do want to hear from experts, not everyone. Not everyone wants to hear from us. And Mike, you're really active on social media amongst a really large group of historians. And so do you think that the internet causes a lot of disruptions in our historical thinking? And do historical discussions that take place online, do they help or do they hinder our understanding of history? That's, that's a really good question. And I think it's a little bit of both. Um, <clears throat> Tom had mentioned earlier that the, the community of historians online is a really good, healthy community. And for the most part, I agree with that. Um, I interact with a lot of people that um, I, I won't say are of the same view, but are respectful that will uh, present their evidence. They'll talk if they've got a problem with something you've said, they're not going to to blow you out of the, the, the water just because you've said something, they'll engage you. Um, but there is an element of of seediness in there as well that I trip across all the time um, in the sort of the, the most obvious example are the uh, the wearaboos is the is what we call them the the nazi lovers the german uh soldier lovers um who think that the tiger tank is cool and the black ss uniforms are sort of the the best in fashion and they were designed by hugo boss i mean that's all i'm gonna say yeah mm -hmm. hugo made them he didn't design them and that's another thing but uh there, there's that element out there. And if you say something about uh, 12th SS division not being elite, all of a sudden there's all these people that come out of the woodwork and say, what are you talking about? It was the Canadians that were were not good soldiers. And and so that that element is there. But I, I, I think social media has been great. And one of the reasons I've spent a lot of time sort of building, I'll say building my brand online is because I think it allows us as historians, as professional historians to speak to an audience in a way that is not accessible through um, academic publishing, whether it's journals or books or edited collections, there's an immediacy there. There's a access to the sort of the average person. Um, I consider myself a public historian, and I think that's really important. I think as historians, we really need to to do this research and then share it with the wider world, not just talk to other uh, people in our field, because then it goes nowhere. It needs to be shared. It needs to be um, distributed around. And social media works really well for that. And um, so I, I would think, by and large, it's a positive thing. The other thing I've I've really enjoyed with social media is the connections I make, uh, the people that I've met. Um, I have found answers to questions that I've asked in ways that I never would have got on my own. They're able to uh, share their knowledge, share their information, direct me to sources or, or, or tell me, no, that's just crap and you don't need to do that. And, and that's all really good. So, yeah, social media has been a really positive development from my point, but I know there's a seedy side as well that I just try not to engage with. Megan, how uh, do you want to maybe without without dropping too many big names, how has your experience been with social media? Yeah, I, like I agree with Mike that it's it's been 90% positive and you know the 10% uh negative, but we're not gonna we're not gonna judge it based on that 10%. Um my actually my use of Twitter as an academic platform actually started with taking a class with Mike um on digital humanities and and putting together a thread on a soldier um from Vernon and and that just um got me right into that. And so yeah, I think it's it's a it's a great tool um and it's it's a great way for uh historians to connect with one another. I've met people like that, just like Mike said. Um, it's actually how I got this position that I'm in now. Um, so I actually have Twitter to thank for my career. Um, but exactly, there's always going to, you know, there's going to be people with differing opinions who aren't going to necessarily voice them respectfully. And those aren't always non-professional historians. I've had some you know, some not nice interactions with professional historians and generally I just don't engage, but you can always, you can always kind of tell something, you know, you, you learn something new about some people uh, when they choose to engage that way. Um, and it, and there is, like Mike said, an immediacy to it. So that also goes for, you know, historians aren't just publishing, you know, they don't have to go publish a professional um, 
book review, right? They can just give a quick comment on Twitter. Um, and, you know, people do build reputations, both good and bad by doing that. Uh, and so I think it's generally been, you know, social media is a wonderful platform and especially public historians are doing great work at um, getting knowledge out into the public and in all different ways, TikToks and Instagram. And, and that's such important work because that's how we're getting the wider, the wider population interested and engaged. And that's how you, that's how people engage with things these days is through social media and visual rules. Um, but of course, there's always going to be, there's always going to be a little niggle, but we're not going to judge it based on that. So we've talked a little bit about current events and how they're shaping us uh, as historians. And so Cynthia, I think it's not an understatement to say that 2022 was a pretty historically significant year. Um, just even talking about like the sort of invasion and occupation of Canada's capital city, we saw a real invasion of Ukraine from Russia. There's these big historical moments. And of course, with that online space, that news can come at us like a freight train. Do you think that you, for you as a historian, like a professional historian who's been working for decades in this field, is it easier or less easy to, to observe those um, current events because you have a vast knowledge of Canadian and world history and the implications of human actions? Is it easier for you as a historian or is it harder? Okay, first of all, the vast knowledge part, never mind. <laughs> um, I was saying earlier, vast knowledge. I'm here. Vast, I'll tell you first. No, I ha I had to say um, that I think that for most professional historians and others as well, the more you practice in this discipline, the more you realize that you really don't know that much. I mean, we're all we all start out thinking, oh, we've got the whole picture. No, because then we become more adept at following clues and this kind of thing and then and layering evidence and we find out oh my god like Mike said earlier you can write ad infinitum before you come to anything like any kind of conclusion so never mind the last part but the knowledge I do have quite frankly makes me want to bang my head against the wall when I hear a lot of the reporting that goes on and the commentary about current events because it is so ahistorical it's as though every damn thing that happens, whether nationally or internationally, is precedent setting. There's never been any clue or hint about it before. I think, Megan, earlier you said something about history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Well, I agree with you. To say that history re repeats is really simplistic. But let's face it, there are patterns. There are similar trends and issues that would connect what has, is happening today uh, with many, many things that have been happening for centuries in the past. I'll draw on, um, Ukraine is pretty obvious, frankly. I mean, rarely do you hear anything about the rise and fall of the Russian Empire or the rise and fall of the Soviet Empire or the Cold War or anything that might give some real context to what's going on here. You know, it's as though Putin got up one morning and decided he's going to, you know, attack Ukraine and Ukraine fights back and NATO, you know, doesn't know what to do about it. Anyway, never mind that. The blockade is the one that particularly bugs me because it shows how absolutely little Canadians know of their own history. That blockade we can put into a much larger context of a historic, ongoing, and fairly regular public protests in this country. And I'll just name just two that every Canadian should know something about. Um, the Winnipeg General Strike in 1919. It was considered at the time by people in power, including the Prime Minister, to be the beginnings of a Bolshevik revolution. Because of the general strikes that, that it fueled right across the country, it basically shut down the country. I can't begin to tell you, I can't remember, frankly. There was something like a strike, a general strike every day somewhere in Canada in 1919. And it's part of a worldwide thing that was going on in 1919 in, in the light of the Bolshevik Revolution. Does anybody mention Winnipeg when they talk about the blockade? Or the Ottawa track in 1935? Uh, protest of the unemployed that started in BC and picked up traction all the way across Canada. Both of these were a particular social group versus the state with the public on either side, either supporting the government or supporting the protesters. Isn't that what we have going on in Ottawa? What makes it different is that, well, onto Ottawa was also considered a Bolshevik revolution in the making. These guys are, the, no one's going to call the the, the uh, current blockade people Bolshevik, uh, closer to fascist, Nazi, or, you know, at least neocon, uh, whatever. But the point is that it's not about the ideology. 
It's about the fact that we have precedents for these things. You know, I've never heard Trudeau, Doug Ford, or anybody else say, well, hey, this was reminiscent of onto Ottawa in 1935. All right. So, again, wouldn't that help? We should, if we knew something like that, we would have a better sense. We could make better sense of what goes on in the present. And, and I'm not pretending that we learn lessons from history, because if we did, we wouldn't have wars and blockades and the like, right? But the point is that we learn something from it. And as my colleagues here have all said in their own eloquent way, um, there are lessons to be learned. And we need to we need to pay attention. And it's just because I really I blame it on the fact that a again social media makes everything instantaneous and context isn't required. This is happening now, people live stream. You know we've never had that before. You know you guys have had it all your lives, but for me it's a new thing, right? Relatively new, you know. But it's really a 21st century thing, right? Wi-Fi live stream is 21st century. So especially for young people, having that sense of the past um, would be very, very helpful. They're impatient and they don't, you know, it's all in front of them right now. So what more do you need? Well, lots. And that's why to add to what was uh, Megan and uh, Mike were, just, were saying about social media, we have to take the reins there and use it to our best capacity to get history out, real history factual, analytical history, not this, you know, I don't have to contend with Nazis, but, you know, I I don't have a, a social media presence, but I do participate actively in, uh, you know, reading the blogs and, and the webinars and, and visiting the various sites, the conversation and so on. So I am paying attention and a lot of it is really good. The trolls are going to get everywhere. Yeah, like, and, and just to sort of build on what, what Cindy's saying, I think what people really need today is the historian's toolbox. They need all the skills that make a good historian great. They need to know how to read analytically. They need to know how to research. They need to exactly. know how to interrogate sources and 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 decide what's a valid source and, and what's crap. Um, they need to know how to... Um, write those ideas, how to speak those ideas, how to form those ideas in their own mind so they can share them with everything. So everything that makes a good historian is, I think, in a lot of ways, what people are missing today. And uh, mm -hmm. as as historians, as teachers, I think that's one thing we can really add. It's good that people know the history we're teaching, but I think as important are the tools we teach them to 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 use in not just doing history, but for life skills. Mm -hmm. Mike, I'm interested in knowing, sort of, I kind of have a similar question for you, which is, I, you're an air power historian, you've studied the Second World War, you and I have talked a lot about Bomber Command, the Bomber Campaign. How has the last year, knowing about the invasion of Ukraine, how has that kind of shaped the way you revisit that history, now that you're, to some degree, you're observing it in your own, not your own life, but you can watch it on TV. How has the last year really shaped you as a historian? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Thanks for that, Carla Jean. I, um, I, I think the way I want to approach that is by pointing out some of the, the takes that, that experts, and I'll put that in air quotes, have, have given about the, uh, the invasion of, of the Ukraine. I think um, when it first happened, there was a lot of um, self-described experts that were saying a lot of things that have more or less not come to pass that Ukraine would be defeated quickly, that of course Russia is going to win, there's no way for them to stand, that if the West intervenes, if they supply weapons, ammunition, tanks, maybe even aircraft, that uh, Russia is going to widen the war, maybe go nuclear. And I think over and over again, we see that these bad takes, and I don't know what's informing them, I don't know if it's their opinion, if it's their study of history, has shown that we need to be very careful about how we share our expertise because some of these people that were, were sharing these takes were um, experienced historians, very good historians or, or other uh, professionals that are, are sharing their opinion. And uh, a lot of them have come to, to, to not pass and, and have looked quite foolish in, in hindsight. So for me, that is, we, we need to be careful with how we use our skills. Um, 
yeah, the idea that history repeats itself or it rhymes, I think the rhyming version is, is a much better take, but it, it doesn't repeat. We can't uh, predict the future based on, on the past. We can offer careful measured views um, about how things might go, but we, we don't know any better than somebody who's on the ground in, in the middle of the conflict. So, yeah, I, I think that's the big lesson I've taken is that um, I, I, I think I'm a very good historian. I think I can do a pretty good job of looking backwards and, and coming up with a, a rational analysis of, of what happened and, and, and more importantly, why. Um, but we, we have to be careful not to broadcast forward because then it, it becomes more prognostication than professional. Uh, I agree 100% with what you were saying, Mike. But I have to say that the Times, you know, uh, local media loves to call me to, for opinions on all kinds of things that I really shouldn't be speaking on, but they drag you in, right? Um, and you do your public duty that way. And what they, they don't want history, they want prophecy, all right? Which True. is what you're, it's the media that distorts things. So those historians are probably, I, I would, I bet a lot of them are really ashamed that they came across making some mm -hmm. ridiculous prediction. You know, nothing is inevitable in history. It, you're absolutely right. It does not repeat. It's not exactly in the same way at any rate. And, you know, those are not things you want to say, but try to say, well, I really can't predict. They will still try to push you that way. And that's, Very you know, much so. when, when will COVID end? Well, God, how do I know? And, you know, what will be the impact of this on the future? If I could foresee the future, you know, I would. But the point is that I'm an historian. I deal with the past. And that's what you're saying. And I think they're really, the media only wants to talk to us if we can give them that sound bite, that, you know, that that sense of what's coming and we, we don't do that well. No one does. Yeah. Short of those with crystal balls. Right. And that, that is, I think that's become our media role. We have to fight that. I totally agree. And and they don't, yeah. they don't want to hear about history unless no. it's a big anniversary. If it's 50 or yeah. 75 or a hundred, other than that, exactly. it's like, forget it. We, we don't need to look right. backwards. Right. Exactly. We don't need to look backwards as I said earlier. And let's just, you know, look forward, even though we can't begin to do that. No one can, but there you go. It really bothers me. It's one of my, per you know, every time I get a call from someone to talk about something, I'm thinking, you you know, and half the time too, uh, don't forget, they cut you to whatever. So you end up saying whatever they want you to say, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's all gonna end tomorrow, says Dr. Kamaku, who's a, you know, a specialist in nothing that we're talking about, <laughs> but it doesn't matter, you know, <laughs> there you go. I'm going to let anybody who wants to pick this one up, pick it up um, because we're, we're, we're talking about it anyway. So when we're thinking about Canadian history in the 21st century, what do you think is one of the biggest disconnects between what historians know from archival research and what the public believes? What do you think is the biggest disconnect we're seeing or the one that's more the most salient to you? Anyone can grab that one. Yeah, I, I, I don't even know where to start on that one because it's a vast one. I was going to say, I, I feel like you're, bite, you're biting for for something specific, but or not something specific, but an event, an event. But I, I just think that it's a bigger issue of nuance, right? They they want they want easy narratives, you know, from Vimy Ridge to D Day to or sorry to D up to D Day to, you know, um, to to use a military uh, example. But I think just the idea of nuance, um, and it's it's not an easy narrative, and things are messy and and overlapping, and there's change and and con continuity and things like that so I think the idea of nuance is the biggest disconnect yeah they don't people don't want to hear about contingencies they, they don't want to be told this happened but at the same time the issue was you know there are many strands intersecting here we have to look at them all you know no they want a very neat very neat linear narrative it starts here and then it does this and then it ends here hopefully in some kind of victory you know, no one wants to hear about a troubled ending. I think that what we're talking about there, if we can, you know, classify it, is a stunning lack of historical consciousness. And we've been saying that throughout this whole, every discussion we've had so far. And by that, I mean that Canadians quite simply 
don't have any real sense of the past. Not everyone, obviously, but a great many, and especially, I hate to say it, but the younger generation, they, they learn very little of even the chronology in um, grade school and high school. Um, and okay, chronology is not what we do, but let's face it, if you don't know what happened when and why it was significant at the time, it's awfully hard to have a sense of historical consciousness or context. And so, you know, to me, that leads to this profound amnesia that we have, the social amnesia. And one example I think of very, uh, is one that we, again, have come back to a few times, but it's, it's hugely relevant right now. And that is the whole woeful tale of the uh, residential schools. Um, I've always talked about the residential schools because the literature isn't new. Mm -hmm. You know, people started, survivors were publishing their memoirs in the 70s already. And it, so social historians would never have ignored that. Now, now it's much better integrated. And, you know, we are trying as per the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to use education as our foremost tool to get the word out there. And you still have people making like, oh, I've never heard of this before. Or how important can it be? Because I've never heard of it before. You know, it's like, come on. How could you have never heard of it at all anywhere? That you was know, definitely it, the biggest thing when it came out is yeah. I was saying to people, like, I was just, it, yeah. it, it's horror. Like I'm thinking back to Kamloops uh, when the, when the figures came out for that, which is, it's yeah. horrifying. And, and, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it horrifying. there's no, there's no doubt about that, but that's what I, I, I felt like I had to keep saying to, you know, people I was chatting with is that it's not new. You know, it is all of a sudden brought to brought to our public attention, which I guess just speaks to what you were saying, Cynthia, is that there's a lack yeah. of, of historical um, knowledge in general, because if there wasn't, this wouldn't be new news or shocking. No. no, it wouldn't be shocking. I mean, it's still horrifying, but it wouldn't come to them as, oh, my God, I had no idea. I actually had one of my students who, again, argued that she had never heard of it before, went home and told her mother about it and her grandmother, and they absolutely denied that this could possibly happen in Canada, you know? And it's like, again, oh, why? We're so much better than everyone, you know? And again, we need to know this stuff. We need to put it out there. But that, again, it, it, we're doing something wrong in our uh, educational system if, you know, according to what they can take in, obviously, you can't tell very young children and the really horrifying facts, but they need to understand that this is part of our history too. It's not all of our history, but it is an important part of our history. And that lack of historical consciousness, like I said, is this public amnesia. That is, amnesia is an illness. It's a bad thing. And again, uh, we need to get over that in order to deal with this kind of stuff properly, the way it needs to be dealt with. My yeah. No, I, I was just going to say, I, I agree with that completely. And um, sort of the flip side of it is that the public consciousness wants to hear affirmation of the, the stories they know and have heard all, all the time. So mm -hmm. I love hearing about the, the Vimy uh, Colony to Nation story. That's what they grew up on. That's what they want to hear. And when you have something different to say about it, then you get into trouble. And um, it's uh, it, it was interesting when we published our... our um, Book on Vimy Ridge in 2007, uh, we got crucified in the media because people thought we were uh, bashing the, the Vimy story, that we were trying mm -hmm. to take apart that story. And it was completely the opposite. It is such an amazing story. Let's just get it in the proper context. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I guess that's, that's part of the problem. I mean, the idea that revisionist history is bad history, um, all, all history by definition is revisionist. Everybody should be building on what is exactly. coming for trying to tell a more complete story using new resources new interpretations telling the story from our perspective today and that's by definition revision that's not bad that's just the way we do it and mm -hmm. there's maybe not a general understanding of that in the, the wider public no there isn't and even among as i said let's say our, we'll say our undergrads you know, they come in there. I've actually had some say to me, you know, all you all you say is the bad stuff. <laughs> and I was like, that's, you know, that's, I'm not here to give you, a, you know, bedtime story. Um, I am bringing in different interpretations. This is the way it was thought of then. And since then it has been revised and made more, you know, and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to depict everything as black. I am just trying to 
present some other perspectives on it at that we have learned as we go along because as you say Mike the historiography moves it doesn't stand still and that's a good thing but I think that a lot of people just wanted to stand still thank you uh sorry <laughs> just reading reading a message from Tom um we we have less than 10 minutes left so I do just want to skip ahead I want to I guess I wanted to mention, I was gonna ask Mike and he basically said it to me is that if if the public wants neat and tidy history is that because that's what we've grown up with and perhaps it is. And so maybe where we're at right now is a moment and have been for a little while, a moment where we can be presenting complex histories that have nuance and that's our job as historians moving forward is to put out there what we'd like to see so with that in mind, I want to just round up this conversation because I have a screaming two-year-old. Um, to my panelists, thank you so much. If we can end with just thinking through what are some of the biggest, we've talked about the challenges, what are some of the biggest opportunities for historians right now and moving forward who are working within that space of 21st century Canada? Mike, let's start with you. Uh, okay. Um, I, I, I guess I want to take it in the direction of, of what Cindy was saying before, is that the more I learn, the less I realize I actually know. And some people have said to me, like, why do you want to study the First World War? Why do you want to study the Second World War? We know everything. And that's so far from the truth. Um, the, more I, the more I look at it, the more I see the gaps, the the holes, the missing pieces, the the untold stories that are, are still out there. And um, for anybody who's thinking about um, becoming a historian, uh, doing an undergrad or, or master's or even a PhD in history, there are so many stories where you can go in and you can be the first person to tell that story. And it, it could be a micro history or it could be a big broad survey. And um, I mean, I, I think we could spend an entire uh, hour talking about those gaps because they're there in every field. And uh, history history is not done. History is not over. Um, <laughs> each generation is going to reinterpret it. Um, Cindy has one story to tell. I have another. Megan is going to look at it through a completely different prism because of her experience, her period of of um wh where she knows uh how she relates to the world which is very different from from cindy and i so i i think there's so much to do out there and um having just seen the uh, the three minute uh, thesis competition i think the future is bright i think there is a lot of um good people coming up through the system that are going to continue to tell those stories and it's needed it's it's desperately needed so that's i think that's what i want to say Cynthia, I want to go over to you. I want to ask what are, again, opportunities for young people who are pursuing history degrees, but I really want to know what are some historical topics broadly defined that are going to get you excited? Wow. My problem, Carla Jean, is that I am one of those enthusiasts who gets carried away. And whenever I hear something, well, I want to pursue that next, you know, kind of, or add it into whatever. But I think that's a good thing, actually. You know, so what I have, I mean, I have always worked in childhood and family is my area of specialization. But even that has opened up incredibly over the years. And while you can't begin to discuss any of it without paying attention to things like race and class and gender and so on, now, because there has been just so much more sophisticated work done in all those areas and even bringing in the whole thing about the um, you know, colonization project and how that impacted children. And you know, these are things that, well, quite simply, they're new paradigms that, we, um, that open up even more interesting questions and more better ways of filling in even more traditional topics. And Part of it, that could be a problem as well in that uh, sometimes critics and God knows <laughs> there are many of those will say, well, X didn't look at gender enough. Um, not thinking that, well, yeah, I saw that recently in a, in a review of a really important um, foundational work by um, Br British historian Thompson, E.P. Thompson on the making of the British working class. He didn't look at gender. Well, it was enough in 1963 to be looking at class, right? We had to give them credit. We had to start somewhere. And so I, I would like people to be a little more appreciative of the fact that paradigm shift 
and we learn from each paradigm shift. And then a good historian will consider all that new work and add in um, and, and enhance their own work by doing that. It's not a matter of jumping on bandwagons, but a matter of using new tools to look at old topics. That's very exciting to me. I had to say on a very practical level, being able to have so much stuff digitized and accessible from my home office has been a tremendous help. It, you used to have to trek across the country and visit archives in towns at the provincial level, you know, um, the national level in Ottawa. That was all great, but because of COVID, it became prohibitive. And if it weren't for the fact that so much has been digitized in such good shape, we still have a long way to go. But there are some really legitimate digitization projects out there. Keep it up, gang. I can't do that kind of thing, but it is so helpful. And that will also provide a lot of opportunity for young people. They don't have to do the tracking. They can. They should do it anyway, just to see the country and so on, because that's important. But it's it's a really good thing to have. Very very helpful. The other side Megan, of it is that we get too many records that way too, though. But Megan, I want to I want to give you the last word here, um, and then I'm going to shut off my camera because again, screaming two year old. Megan, I want to know where you kind of see some of those digital technologies or digital platforms going for people your age and younger and how that could really impact what we're doing for Canadian history. And then we're gonna give it to Tom. So I'm gonna bow out here um, and go see my screaming two-year-old who's saying mommy, mommy. And so Megan, take it away, you get our last word. Great, thank you, Carla. Um, I think, I mean, like Cindy said, I think it's such an opportunity uh, to, uh, you know, the whole like access the, the the question of access you know not all um grad students have the access to funds to be able to travel and mm -hmm. canada is a huge country um and like just so this level of access is huge um but you know we we do have to use things critically we have to always question our sources but this is something historians have to do anyway uh so i don't think that's something you know that any good historian should uh be too worried about but we have this whole new new level of access um and and I just do want to jump in a little bit on the question Carla asked Mike because it's had me thinking and I was I was very excited about that question so she's not here anymore so I'm going to answer that question anyway. Mm -hmm. um, uh, opportunities for historical study. Now, I think that the biggest thing, and and she had this on her list of questions, and I know we got so into other things that we didn't get to it. It's just like what I've noticed um, now that I've been in the UK studying uh, for about six months now, and and I think it's uh, something. The biggest thing I've taken away is the need to take you know, ask big questions and take large perspectives. And um, I mean, of course, my PhD thesis is huge. It's looking at army training across the entire British Empire in the Second World War. And that's a huge question. That's a macro level study. Um, and I think that it's just so important uh, to to ask those big questions and to look transnationally like, you know, we don't just look at the war from 1939 to 1945. Let's broaden it out. Um, and, and same goes with anything else. So just asking these big questions, contextualizing across time and geography, because that's partially what historians are here to do. We're here to create this narrative, weave it together across across larger periods. Um, and so I think it's just really important to, you know, both do the the small histories and things like that. And, and you know, I think we've been, uh, the way of Canadian history has been great about, you know, digging into the weeds and doing social history and things. But um, I've especially noticed in the, in the British community, you know, because history, there's a larger community of historians over here that, you know, a lot of things have been covered. And, and I mean, I'm not at all like uh, going against what Mike said, saying that, you know, everything's done. Um, but, you know, let's remember to ask some big questions um, and, and look at things more broadly. All right. Well, thank you. That gets us right on the mark for, for two o'clock. Um, I have a feeling this conversation probably could go on for hours more, but it, it was, um, I, I really appreciate your, your candor, your comments, your, your insights. That, that was great. There was a couple questions um, that popped into the chat, but I, I think you kind of touched on that through the, the conversation and, and also don't want to keep folks any longer than, than we have already. So thank you so much for today. Um, really, really appreciate uh, your judging the three minute thesis competition and then make yourself available for this discussion. And then uh, for everyone else, um, 
Chris McKay also had to run. Uh, but, you know, I'd like to thank Chris for all his support over the last two days. And, and thank you to our audience or everyone that, that's joined any portion of the conference weekend. Uh, we've really enjoyed it. And, and I think we've had a very successful weekend.